We'll take your Bibles and ask you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And appreciate your presence being with us today. Good to have some of my family with me. I'll not tell you where they're at because you try to find stories about me that embarrass me thoroughly. No, I'm just kidding. Good to have my two aunts and my grandmother here today and as well a couple of my aunts' husbands, uncles today. My grandma's birthday is on Tuesday of this week and mine's on, uh, well, it doesn't matter as much, but it's later in the week on the 27th. And so we're going to have some fellowship after church today, but good to have them with us. As well as several other guests and family members, it's our privilege to have you in the service today. First Timothy chapter 6, let's begin in verse number 9, and we'll read a couple of verses there and then skip down and go down to verse 17. First Timothy chapter 6, let's begin in verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Skip down, if you will, to verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Notice verse 19 laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. This morning we want to look at, both this morning and tonight, this subject of relocating, making the big move that produces in our lives stewardship and all the splendors and joys of it. Let's pray and ask God to help us today. Father, thank you for the joy it is to be in this setting today and to sing these songs of comfort and reminder, God, of who you are. And Lord, how stable and how sure our future is because of you. And that we're so grateful today, God, for the hope, the peace, and the comfort, God, that comes through your spirit and through your word and what it reminds us of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're so grateful today for that. Father, as we now seek to steward and to manage and to properly do with what you've entrusted to us, God, may you help us today to see what we have in light of eternity. God, to use it for your glory and honor. May our faith be strengthened today. May our obedience be uh, more fully implemented. And Lord, may each of us walk out today more in tune with your economy, with your plan, and with your purpose. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do in Christ's name. Amen. The question this morning is this, and we'll answer this throughout the day, is are you willing and am I willing to move to the corner of Freedom Boulevard, which is what we're going to look at this morning, and Focus Lane? We're going to talk about this corner lot that each of us needs to move to in our stewardship if we're to experience all that God wants us to. Now this morning we want to begin by looking at what it means to be free uh, as we steward everything we have in a way that pleases and honors God. Have you ever had a conversation with someone, you're on the phone with them, and they, are, they have several children in their life? And your conversation with them kind of feels like you're talking to five different people and they're talking, you know, it kind of goes something like this. Yeah, I'd love to go shopping, a lady would say. Stop licking that. At what time was that? You know, they just keep going back and forth, you know, saying something to the kid and you're trying, it, would they say it to me? I wasn't licking the phone. You know, I'm just talking to you here, you know. Just the fragmented aspects. You know, many times the blessings God gives us, our kids, we say that through gritted teeth, they're blessings, right, sometimes? that those blessings as well as others, often they own us more than we own them. And they control us and they hinder us and they often halt our uh, full fellowship and blessing from God. And what I want to submit to us today is what we have and what we don't have is divinely orchestrated by God. And if we'll see what God has blessed us with from His view, it will only further enhance our liberty and our freedom to fellowship and to serve Him in a greater way. Often our stuff creates a great hindrance in our spiritual clarity and conviction. And as we lose from materialism, we are now able to freely serve the Lord. Now what I want to do today here in this text is look at two freedoms or liberties that come to us when we steward everything we have and are for the Lord. And I hope that you'll embrace the truth and apply it as God leads. Number one, you and I, when we are willing to steward as we should what God has entrusted, it frees us from the threats of materialism. It frees us from the threats of materialism. There was a story in a program on PBS a few years ago 
and the title of the program was something to the effect, it was talking about what he referred to it as affluenza. And it defined affluenza as we just have too much, and with that comes certain maladies and sicknesses and weaknesses in our understanding. And in the program, it claimed the following, that by the age 20, we have seen one million TV commercials. By age 20, some of you do the math in your life, wherever you're at, how many you've seen in your stint here on this planet. Recently, secondly, claim more Americans declared bankruptcy than graduated from college. Number three, 90% of divorce cases, uh, in 90% of divorce cases, arguments about money played a prominent role. Number four, the average American shops six hours a week while spending 40 minutes playing with his or her children. We are consumed, we are controlled by, and we are greatly hindered by the things we so want and desire and many times strive to enjoy. I want to encourage you today to let God release you from that. Still some joy and some things they can benefit us in, but see it from God's perspective. A couple things under this I would give you. Number one, God protects us when we are stewarding properly. He protects us from dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. Would you look again at our text at verse number nine? It says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. When we steward as we should, God protects us from the dissatisfaction that comes. Notice he says in verse 9, they that will be rich. There's a want to be rich. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or somewhere in the middle. This morning, it is a desire for riches that poses a great threat to our future with the Lord. Someone said this, people tend to run out of money before mirages. So they cling to the myth that things they can't afford will satisfy them. If you notice that, there's always one. If I just had that, then I would be satisfied. The problem is we always have at least something else that we think will satisfy. You ever notice the wealthy in our, in our, in our economy and in our country, when you have it all, the, the, the dissatisfaction of that, in some of the celebrities of our day taking their own lives, destructive behavior because they've gotten there and there's no mirages left and yet still there's a gnawing dissatisfaction in their heart. And I found in my short lifespan, everything I've ever wanted, worldly speaking, doesn't quite live up to the hype. You want it, you look for it, you work for it, yet it always comes up empty if God is not a part of that process. Notice two things that it delivers us from in this area of dissatisfaction. First of all, number one, in temptation. Notice he says, for they that will be rich fall into temptation. Instead of giving satisfaction, riches create additional lust or desires. And these lusts demand being satisfied. Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. And if you're looking to anything or anyone else besides God himself, you will continue to be dissatisfied. No matter how much you have, no matter how long you have it, God alone can satisfy the deep cravings of your heart. The covetous pursuit of money always leads to sin, and we see that. Have you ever said this or heard something? Just follow the money. Man, that reveals, doesn't, corruption. It reveals the heart and the wrong motivation of so many. And it is only generosity that can release us from that pull of greed. Second, number two, notice in verse 9, he goes on to say, they that will be rich fall into temptation. Notice, and a snare. Number two, not only does God protect us from a dissatisfying temptation, but number two, a dissatisfying trap. The trap. Any of you see the story this week in Wayne County? There was uh, 850 pounds of beef stolen. Did any of you see this story? It just kind of has been going on this week. Uh, three or four folks stole uh, here in Canaan Township, up our way where we live. Uh, they, they stole 850 pounds of ground beef, from what I understand of the story. And, and I don't know about you, you only can handle so much meat, all right? The story went, they finally found these guys, and they had, it, they had it packed in bathtubs, two bathtubs, I think, in the house. Some of it they'd put in bags with snow, but just trying to keep all this meat cold. Having too much stuff actually hinders us. For one thing, those guys weren't taking baths, you know? <laughs> That's one thing that came to my mind right away. You know, how much meat can you eat, you know, before it goes bad? Too much is just too much. And I would submit to you, many of us believers, we are gorged. We may not think we are, but in comparison to much of those that live on this planet, we are gorged. And we wonder why we're so dissatisfied. Stewardship, seeing every little nuance and little aspect of our lives from God's perspective changes our view. It's not for us. 
It's for God, and it's for others that are blessed by it. How do we have that kind of a view? Well, go back, if you will, to verse 6 here in our text, and notice that a generous person is a contented person. Unlike the dissatisfied folks described in the next verse, go back to verse number 6 and notice this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Notice, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. When you and I see our lives as a matter of stewardship, it doesn't matter how much or how little, it's God is good, God is great, and God has given me what I need. Therefore, I can rest and be content in that. Do you remember the prodigal son? In Luke 15, he bought into the idea that if I just have everything that I can get my hands on, it will satisfy me. Where did that lead him? He said, Father, give me my inheritance. And he went and wasted on riotous living, the Bible says. And where did he end up? Pig pen, eating with pigs. There is a craving in our hearts that will destroy us and dissatisfy us to where we will begin to pursue that which is unholy and that which is greatly dissatisfying, and it will ruin our opportunities and relationship with the Lord. What happens when you and I give as we should? It frees us from that dissatisfaction. It keeps us from that trap. So often it's sprung and we are not aware of it. We had a man in our church, and I think most of you are aware of this, Nick Hinkle was in a head-on collision, one of the good men of our church this past week, and uh, he's still uh, working through that and recovering from that. We were talking in the hospital that night at the hospital, what had happened, and he said, they said, Pastor, what, basically what happened is a lady was coming the other way, and unfortunately she had a massive health trauma that happened. We don't know all the specifics yet. I think she may have even died before the collision, but she lost all sense of faculties, and she swerved left right in front of him. They were both doing about 45, so you imagine hitting a wall at 90. That's the impact of that collision. And he said this, which he was a little medicated, but still working through. He said, Pastor, he said, I know we trust the Lord, but he said, we put so much faith in people coming the other way on two-lane roads. You know, there's not a lot, enough money on this planet to protect you from moments like that. There's not enough money to keep someone here on this planet that God says it's their time to go. Money has its limits, doesn't it? And it comes up empty at some point. But when we use it for God's glory, and our focus is ultimately on Him, it insulates it, us, it protects us from the traps and the temptations that come with that money. Only God honoring generosity will protect you from being in want as the prodigal son was and to have deep satisfaction from the Lord. Now secondly, if you will, look, notice that back in verse 9, the end of verse 9. There's a second protection that God gives when we steward our lives, our resources, our abilities in a way that please Him. Notice it, the end of the verse. They that will be rich fall in temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Number two, God protects us as we steward properly as we make that move from the destruction of materialism. Not just the dissatisfaction, but the destruction. I don't know if you saw this or not, but there was a story in the news this past week that they have gotten the first artificial heart to take hold in a, a 71-year-old gentleman. And the intention is this, it's an artificial heart. It's made and structured just like a human heart, some of the components of it. But they've done all this technology, and they said at most it will last for two years, two to three years. And they, they talked about the billions of dollars that had been invested and would be invested in creating an artificial heart. You know that our heart at some point will stop? At some point our heart will stop craving and longing for what it has. Our heart is weak, our heart is deceptive. And if we let our heart's desires go unchecked, they will destroy us. They will hinder us. Notice two things that happen when our heart is full of our own desires as opposed to God's. In verse 10 he says, or verse 9 he says, foolish and hurtful lust. Now notice verse number 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It hurts us, it hinders us. God protects us from destruction, first of all, in the area of evil. You ever notice that money, when it is unchecked and when it's untempered by God and His rules and the sense of morality, always evil is a part of that place, isn't it? Money breeds, contempt, or breeds corruption when God is not a part of that. I have a pet peeve of mine. I don't even know if I've told my wife this, but are you like me when you go to your, to your bathroom and you, wherever you keep your toothbrush? Does it bother you like me if it's wet when you first get it out? 
all right? Uh, I like my toothbrush dry, as in it wasn't used this morning by my son or my wife to maybe clean the tile on the floor or whatever. I like a dry toothbrush, and I like it, I like it when I walk in, the bristles to be pointing maybe the opposite direction of the other bristles in that little cylinder you got in, you follow my drift. I like it to be pure. I like it to be uh, separate. If we're not careful, we fail to connect the dots between unchecked appetite for material things and the evil that always accompanies it. You cannot without God separate materialism and evil. They go together. They feed upon one another. But as we use what we have for God's glory, it purifies and it refines us. So I would submit to you this morning in verse 9, if they that will be rich have all of these challenges in their life and all of these threats, then they who do not desire to be rich and instead desire to use their resources for God's glory, protect themselves and preserve themselves in the sight of God. I may encourage you this morning to let God work in your heart in this area. Loving what money can do for God and others protects us from a love of money which in and of itself always produces evil. It is the root of all evil. Secondly, notice in verse number nine, he goes on to say, or verse 10, while, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. God protects us from evil when we steward as we should. Number two, he protects us from error. He protects us from error. I saw a statement the other day. Someone said this, you know how you can smack something to get it to work? I wish I could do that for other people. You know, just, <laughs> come on, do what you're supposed to. Get back in line. I think God many times in our lives is trying to take the things that we have and trying to encourage us and challenge us. Listen, use this for me. Use this for my glory. Don't use this to go do your own thing. As we do so, we err from the faith. Quick example of that. Would you go to Matthew 19? Hold your place there, if you would, please, in 1 Timothy 6. Go over to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. And I challenge you to see yourself in this story. Don't be overly critical of this young man. Let God use it in your heart to challenge your own thinking where there is a parallel in your own priorities. Matthew chapter 19, and if you would please look at verse 16. Christ has this young ruler who is also a rich ruler come to him. And in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, it says this, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And obviously God did this to test him and to refine his understanding. And he goes through and says, I've kept all of these commands from my youth up. Notice now he says in verse 20, what lack I yet? He knew something was still missing. He's rich. He's religious. He's got all the things we normally associate with someone who is doing what they're supposed to. And yet he knew something was missing. Notice what Christ says in verse 21. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Notice this now, verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Notice back in our text there in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that it says, have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Ultimately, where wealth will lead us, where talent will lead us, anything God gifts us with, if we use it for ourselves, it will lead to error. It will lead to destructive, faulty decisions. Giving is the only antidote to materialism. Giving is joyful surrender to the greater person and agenda of God, and it dethrones ourselves and it exalts God. There was a story the other day I read of a lady. Her name was Hetty, H-E-T-T-Y Green. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, Hetty Green is, is on record as being the biggest miser who ever lived. Story is told that her father died when she was 30, leaving her, for, leaving her with an inheritance of more than $100 million in today's money. Though it was unusual for a woman to be involved with banking and investing at that time, she concentrated all of her efforts and attentions on growing the family fortune. Her focus on money drove a wedge between her husband and their two children, and the family was scattered. She was known for eating cold oatmeal to save money for heating and washing only the hem of her dress to save money on soap. 
She was sometimes called the witch of Wall Street. And this was fascinating to me, just challenging. When her son Ned broke his leg as a boy, she tried to have him treated in a free clinic for the poor before treating him at home. His leg would let her ha later have to be amputated. Hetty Green was worth the equivalent of some $4 billion today when she died. But she died alone and miserable. And we've all met miserable, wealthy folks, haven't we? Wealthy in their abilities. They've got talent, man, we'd love to have. They've got resources. They've got time. They've got whatever. That in and of itself does not bring joy. In fact, it brings misery when God's not a part of the equation. I encourage you today to let God in on what he's given to you and to direct you in it. Secondly, number two, not only does God provide freedom in the area of materialism, that's kind of the negative side of the coin, but number two, we also now, if we are stewarding properly, we are able to become free to trust God. Would you go now to the last three verses we read together a moment ago, beginning in verse 17. So we become free from the threats of materialism. Number two, we become free to trust God. Verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, notice nor trust in uncertain riches, but, and it's insinuated based on the previous phrase, that we would trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And so as we steward properly, we are able now to freely, with abandonment, trust in God. The other day I was coming home, in fact, I was coming home from visiting one of the hospital visits. It's been, obviously, as you know, a busy week for us, a ministry. Many of you have been encouraging and helpful. But I was coming home from the hospital. I believe it was from seeing uh, Nick in Akron General. And my wife called me, and she said, I've got a little problem here at the house. Uh, she said, uh, the boys' bathroom door got locked. And we have inside doors where, you know, you can lock the inside and shut it, and it's just locked. I'm miles away and, you know, it's, it's late in the evening and the boys are supposed to be going to bed. Maybe that was part of their strategy in locking the door. I don't know. But anyway, here's mom outside and I'm on the phone. Have you ever tried to talk through something on the phone where you're not there and you realize, I know I could do it if I was there, but trying to art, communicate what needs to be done. And I told her, well, when you go, there's this little hole in the middle. If you take a pin, you can probably tap it and pop it and it'll open. And she tried that and that didn't work. And so we went secondly to a screwdriver. Next on my list was a sledgehammer, but that was level two, you know. And so I, I'm talking her through, like, you know, there's two screws on the side, and you loosen it, and then you pull the knob out, and then you have to pull the, she literally had to take the doorknob off so the boys could get what they needed done and go to bed. But I was talking her through that and just trying to communicate that and articulate that. And she was doing exactly what I told her. I thought when I got home, there would be a door, you know, bashed in, or I, I didn't know what was going to happen as a result of that little moment of trust on the phone. You know, with God, there, there is a door that often we close ourselves. And God says, come to me and trust me. The key to that door is stewardship. See, before God's going to give us and God's going to sustain us, we have to first entrust him with what we have. So often we want to control and manage what we have. And as a result, we lack faith in God. Most believers are weak believers, not because they're greedy, but because they're locked out by their unresolved fears. Notice, if you will, in this verse, verse 17, a couple of things. He says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in, notice this, uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Number one, God provides for us when we entrust him with what we have, the ability to enjoy, the ability to enjoy. Now, when you read that verse, or you heard me read that verse, they that are rich in the world, did you think, okay, well, that's not for me. That, that's for those rich people. I was sharing with our church a few Sunday nights ago, the average person uh, who from age 25 to 65 makes 25000 a year. Forget all the extra benefits, interest earned, pay raises, et cetera. Just 25000 a year for those 40 years will have over a million dollars passed through his hands or her hands. Do you know how much wealth we have do you know how much health God has given us, time we have that other believers and other generations have not had? We are rich in this world, dear beloved. We have so much. May we make sure we use it for God's glory. A couple things under that I would give you. God provides for enjoyment. First of all, in the area of confidence. Did you notice that? He says, don't trust in uncertain riches. Trust in God who is certain. There is confidence that comes, an enjoyable confidence 
when we entrust God with everything we have, everything we are, like many of Jesus' sayings, it's a paradox. Our human nature screams just the opposite. We say it's more blessed to receive than give, to accumulate than to distribute. And God says we are to give. And as we give, the enjoyment of those things and those opportunities is only enhanced. I have noticed that with wealth and with prosperity often comes pride. Have you noticed that? With my money, I can take care of anything. With my abilities, I can do anything I want. But it is a steward that humbly acknowledges God has given, God has blessed. It puts our confidence not in ourselves, but in the God who gave it. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18 says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. The possessing of material wealth ought to humble a person, and cause him or her to glorify God, not himself. And I would submit to you, when we give ourselves to God, it only enhances our dependence upon that God. Second, number two, notice the end of verse 17. He says, which giveth us richly, notice, all things to enjoy. All things to enjoy. As a teenager and a young adult, I had to work through this in my own mind, where if I give God all that I have, am I going to get all that I want? Am I getting all that I need? If I surrender to God... Am I going to miss something that my buddies won't? Or am I not going to have something that others that I know and interact with have? One of the things I love about stewardship is this. By giving God everything, God says we will have richly all things to enjoy. We're not going to miss anything by giving our time to God this week, by giving Him our, our resources, by giving Him our abilities. We're not going to miss anything. We're going to have all things that God wants us to experience. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. As I mentioned, two of my aunts are here today. My Aunt Diana, who's had some health concerns recently, is not here. Uh, my mom's oldest sister, uh, sister. And I get a birthday card from her every year, and all of us nieces and nephews do. And Aunt Diana always has in that card, you know, happy birthday and a thoughtful scripture verse or something. Very encouraging spiritually to me as an aunt. But she always puts inside of that what is just, I, I know it's going to be there every year. I haven't gotten a birthday card from her yet this year, maybe not with her health concerns. But every year when I open it up, you know, it's got her name and everything. But there's always this little bump you can feel if you rub your hand across that envelope. And when you open up, there's a stick of gum, flat piece of Wrigley's or something. And I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid-30s and I still get a stick of gum for my birthday from my Aunt Diana. And I know it's going to be there every year. And usually what I do is I open up that card and... As I begin to read the sweet things she's saying, I chew on the sweet things she gave me. And I, I just something I've done since a kid. And it, it, it's enjoyable to experience her love and her appreciation for me. You know that enjoying what is on this planet doesn't just happen. God has to enable you to enjoy it. You can be miserable with every comfort at your disposal. Everything you could ever want, you can have it and still be miserable. We have emotions. There's a depth to us that's beyond just the superficial. But God says, I will not only give you things, I will cause you to enjoy those things, to experience the pleasure and purpose in which I've given them to you. Our God-given resources should not make us a consumer. They should not make us a miser. They should motivate us to become a person who enjoys the purpose for which God has given them. Notice, secondly, if you will, a couple things about this uh, confidence. And secondly, notice the end of verse, oh, I meant to give this to you. Number two, comprehensive, and we'll move on. This allness of our stewardship. God gives us something not just to have, but to hold and to enjoy. Secondly, and lastly, look if you will, verse 18, that they do good. Once we have these things, we're enjoying these things. Notice that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Number two, God provides not just enjoyment with that which we have, but employment. Employment. We are to use, we are to work with that which God has entrusted to us. I read a story the other day of a pizza delivery guy, and he, he brought the pizza to the house, and this young teenage kid came to the door, and, uh, and you know how pizza guys do. They, you know, they pop out the pizzas, and you, know, you exchange money for uh, what the pizza is, and the pizza delivery guy gave the amount to this teenage boy, and the boy handed him the money. In fact, it was a check. And so out of his hand with the check in, he gave the check, and then the, the teenager noticed that in his other hand were three $1 bills. 
And uh, the pizza guy took the check, and there was kind of an awkward moment. The kid took the pizzas. And finally, the teenager said, uh, could that right there in your other hand, could that be my tip? And the teenage boy thought for a moment. He said, yeah, not bad for just walking a few steps to get the pizza. Do you know how often we misinterpret what is ours and what is for us and what is not for us? If we're not careful this morning, we miss out on why God has given us what we have. Those resources are for others. Those resources are for God. Two things and we'll be done. Number one, there's first of all enrichment that comes. We're able to enrich others. We're able to encourage others as we give as we're supposed to. We use our wealth, we use our talents, we use our time to share, to bless and to enrich others' lives. Barbara Bush, former first lady, once said this, giving frees us from the familiar territory of our own needs by opening our mind to the unexplained worlds occupied by the needs of others. There's just something about it. You see someone else's need and you get to participate in that and encourage that person. What a joy, what a privilege. Now you will notice in verse 17 that he refers to those who are rich in this world. And then you notice in verse 18 he says, rich in good works. We're the one that makes the change. We have things God gives us. We now are able to enrich others. And as a result, we are rich in good works. Lastly, look at verse 19. And this is where the promise is and where the blessing is as we steward properly. Notice he says, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Number two, we also get employment that lasts into eternity. There's an eternal aspect of the work we do for God, the blessing we provide and encouragement to others. Um, there was a picture the other day I saw of a cassette tape and a pencil. And they were asking the question to kind of test when you were raised. You know, the old cassette tapes? Um, some of you go back pre that, you know, the eight track or something else, we won't go there today, but the cassette tape and a pencil. And they said, this dates you. Do you know the connection between the cassette tape and the pencil? How do you know the connection, all right? My boys, the other, it, you take the pencil, the eraser, and you stick it in those little prongs. I don't know all the high tech, it wasn't real high tech, but, and you can rewind or fast forward. The other day we were watching one of my old basketball tapes at the house and dad brought a VHS player. We didn't have one. And the boys, they were watching me rewind. And it's, you know, it's, and they're, what's it doing, dad? You know, just go to the next menu list, you know. It, 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 it's amazing, the, the things that move from our minds. But the connection between those two things. Do you know there's a connection between this life and the next? And a person that believes that automatically wants to steward everything in this life in light of what is to come. I'm not here today to get anything from you. I'm here to remind you there's much God wants to give you. And it's intimately connected to our stewardship in this life. There's an eternal dimension that motivates us and moves us to use our resources for God's glory and honor. Here's a statement. You may want to jot this down. Whatever is given to Christ, whatever is given to Christ is immediately touched with immortality. Whatever is given to Christ is immediately touched with immortality. One second of our time to share Christ. One moment in prayer. One moment working with our children. One moment working in ministry. One moment putting some money in. One moment developing our abilities. It matters. It's immortal. I've told our men many times, I love coming to church and doing the same thing I could do at my house, but it's different because I'm doing it for the Lord. I can mow grass. I can clean a... Uh, you know, a bathroom. I can do something in my home and it's just stuff, but when I do it for the Lord, it's now significant from an eternal view. I encourage you today to see that, enjoy that, embrace that for God's glory. Stewardship allows us to begin working now for the only boss that's in eternity. We don't have to wait till heaven to work for God and be employed by Him. We can start today. One last verse. Would you go to Hebrews chapter 11? As we wrap up our thoughts today, Hebrews chapter 11, and if you would please, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. There was a story as you're finding your spot there in the news. I don't know how many, how many of the men in the room have a pickup truck, but if you've noticed in the news lately, there's some trends taking place as comp uh, competition takes place between the automakers 
And what they're now doing is beginning to design and prepare, I think in the next year or two, to unveil pickup trucks made almost completely out of aluminum. My thought is the pickup trucks I've ever had rust, so that was the first, hey, that's a good thing. But the primary reason why they're doing that is to lighten the trucks so that the fuel economy goes up. You know, there's still obviously the strength that's needed there, but they're trying to get lighter and leaner to be more efficient. And I would submit to you this morning, based on Hebrews chapter 11, that we travel a little too heavy. You ever tried traveling with a real heavy backpack on your shoulders? You've just lugged around unnecessary things. It encumbers you. It hinders you. Can I encourage you to lighten your load, lighten your perspective, and let God do in your heart what he's doing in mind. Hebrews 11, if you will, look at verse 13. Here's the mindset we should have. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Notice this but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Frees us from the materialistic aspects of this life and focuses us upon that which is promised us. We can believe God that those things will shortly come. Someone said this, as long as I still have something, I believe I own it. But when I give it away, I relinquish control, power, and prestige. At the moment of release, the light turns on. The magic spell is broken. My mind clears. I recognize God as owner, myself as servant, and others as intended beneficiaries of what God has entrusted to me. Giving does not strip me of vested interest. Rather, it shifts my vested interest from earth to heaven, from self to God. Giving, notice, breaks me free from the gravitational hold of money and possessions. Giving shifts me to the new center of gravity which is heaven. The question this morning is, are you willing to make the move to be free from the threats of materialism? They're eating alive our planet. They're ruining homes and families and marriages and ministries. Stuff is just stuff. God wants us to know more and experience more from him. And second, number two, where you're doubting God and fearful, if you'll give yourself to him, you're not free to trust him. It's in his hands. It's in his control. We have some folks in the room, I know of, that just lost their job this past week, and I pray for you, feel for you. Others have gone through great financial challenges. Maybe you've lost some of the abilities you used to have. But what you have left today, are you willing to give it to God? Trust Him with it? Ask Him to use you to do something great for His glory? May each of us surrender. May each of us steward in a way that pleases Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You today for Your Word.